Welcome to Agatha Christie, She Watched, our spoiler-heavy look at the movie and TV adaptations of the mystery genre's greatest writer. I'm Bill Peschel of Peschel Press, publishers of the annotated novels of Agatha Christie, and today we're talking about horrible mothers, infantile children, bus tours to shrines, and pratfalls. It's Promise of Death, the 2021 Japanese adaptation of the novel Appointment with Death. But first, let me introduce my partner in marriage, as well as crime of the fictional kind, Teresa Peschel. Teresa, how are you doing today? Hi, Bill. I'm feeling very good. We had a lovely day yesterday at Choctoberfest, and I'm looking forward to discussing a really good version of Appointment with Death instead of the, the Appointment with Mediocrity and the, the Appointment with Drivel that the two previous versions were. Right. We found this version. <laughs> this is one of three movies that's starring a Japanese actor, Mansai Nomura, as instead of Hercule Poirot, Takeru Suguro. Although I think we're just going to go ahead and use the English. We're going to reference Poirot and the Boyntons and all the characters from Appointment with Death because it's just a little easier than us trying to handle the Japanese names. We found a version of this on Daily Motion the website in two parts, so we were able to watch it. And despite the fact that it was rendered very fuzzy and there were patches of problems with the video, and this was all on me actually, the quality on the Daily Motion website is far better. I'm hearing Teresa talk throughout this saying they're following the novel. It was amazing. They followed the novel. This is the third version of Appointment with Death, and they got it right. They got it all right. There are very minor changes from the novel, the, other than, of course, making everyone Japanese and setting it in 1955 after the war during the recovery period. The other major change is that it turns out that, and remember, we're going to use the English names here, that Poirot knows Lady Westholm. They met when he was a young policeman, a young, very clever policeman, and she's escaping police custody. She's a thief in the Ginza, and he captures her. That's how he knows who she is. In the novel, Poirot didn't know Lady Westholm, but that's how he knew what her background was. But that was the only major change this is a very Japanese movie, and yet it is so true to the novel in the way that the Peter Ustinov version was tedious, although it was set in the correct time period and everything, and the David Suchet version, I'm sorry to say, was utter drivel from start to finish, including slave trading white nuns, the or white slave trading nuns, nuns yeah, a Polish there. nun, no less. And it was just awful, just absolutely awful. We took one for the team. If you want to watch Slave Trading Nuns and people who did much better movies set in the sand <laughs> than that one, well, feel free, but be forewarned. But if this was so much better. They got Mrs. Boynton right. So this is about the Boynton family, which is just Mrs. Boynton and her children who are all adopted. And she abuses... Well, no, they're, they're her stepchildren. They're, they're stepch oh, they're stepchildren? I thought they were adopted, though. In, in oh, oh, no. Oh, no. In the novel, Mrs. Boynton was Mr. Boynton's second wife. Oh, right. I'm getting this confused with the other, other wicked <laughs> mother who adopts all her children that we've seen a couple of episodes of as that well. That was the that's, David Suchet one. Well, this is... Uh, no, that's Ordeal by Innocence. Yes, Ordeal by Innocence, all of the children were adopted. Okay, but anyway, these are the stepchildren. She abuses them anyway, so we'll just <laughs> leave it at that. But this is the Boynton family, and she abuses them so much, they're infantile. She has never let them off the leash. Right. And she, uh, Mrs. Boynton was a former prison warden who married up. God knows what Mr. Mr. Boynton was thinking. Maybe he wanted a mother for his children because he was a widower. And then she had one more, Ginny. He died. The implication is that Mr. Boynton was not just wealthy, but he wasn't long for the world, and maybe she helped him along. Who knows? But he died fairly soon, I guess, after Ginny was born, and he was no longer there to protect the children, not that he ever did. Mrs. Boynton revels in having power over other people. The implication is she is not a physical sadist. She is a psychological sadist. She wants to watch you suffer. She eats your fear, your panic, your terror. She has never let the kids off the leash. 
Lennox married partly as an accident because one of the things that's hard to do with young men is when the hormones come on, if they have the opportunity to slip off into town to the dance to meet girls, that sometimes they will, no matter how browbeaten they are, because the hormones are stronger. And he met Nadine, and it turned out she was a nurse, and Mrs. Boyenton saw the opportunity to expand her group of victims. She uses all the tools. She berates them. She has a heart condition that uh, she uses to play on their pity. Because she infantiles them, they're dependent upon her as well, because they say repeatedly, especially in post-war Japan, because like you say, it's the mid-50s, and they can't work on their own. They don't feel like they can do this. In fact, one of the boys, Lennox, Lennox had a business that failed. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but you wonder how, if he could have done better, if he wouldn't have been under his stepmother's spell, she could have made it better, but she always is going to make it worse. They just handled this so well because you see the four Boyenton children and Nadine, and they are so browbeaten. They're much younger than their physical age, and I didn't see that in any of the other adaptations. You don't see the hopelessness. But what you also don't get in the other adaptations, and they handle this so beautifully, Dr. Sarah confronts Mrs. Boyenton about how she is a monster, absolutely a monster, and yet at the same time she is a pathetic old woman, and outside of her own household, where she reigns supreme, anybody looking at her is going to see a pathetic old woman who is a control freak, that she doesn't have the power that she thinks she does, and this wasn't in any of the other versions, and as an example of her not having the power that she thinks she does they're staying at this lovely hotel and she's asked to change rooms why is she asked to change rooms because an important person has come to the hotel who stays at that hotel and wants this particular room because of the beautiful view it is lady westholm she gets what she wants because she's important and mrs boyenton is just a rich but pathetic old woman with no power right and she's angry she is angry and for those of you who wonder why the boyantons are taking this tour in the novel agatha makes it clear uh, mrs boyanton is becoming a little bored because nothing's happening anymore she has everyone completely browbeaten even nadine but nadine still has the strength of character to say i am not going to get pregnant and give you another victim so she takes them on a vacation mainly to give them a sense of false hope and then she will rein them back in tighter than ever and finish destroying them. Because it takes place in Japan. It takes place at a hotel near some very important Shinto shrines. You can find it on the internet. They, they really do exist. The hotel exists. The places where they were exist. And, and if you go where, there, you might even see Tengu. That might be. Waro is there as well. He encounters the family. He also encounters sarah king the doctor yes and again and also uh lady westholm who is a member of parliament a very important and and one of the first women in parliament and he recognizes her and you get a brief flashback of when they met before the war in probably the early 1930s when she was a runaway thief and he compliments her he sees her in the picture in the newspaper, he recognizes her, and he compliments her on how she has completely remade her life. She changed her name, she took full advantage of the chaos of the war and then the post-war rebuild to turn herself into a different person, to marry well, and to become somebody. She changed her life around. And as a matter of fact, she has an editor with her to write her autobiography, and, and Poirot asks, are you going to include those early years? And she said, absolutely really not. not, and I hope you're going to keep your mouth shut about it as well. And he said, absolutely, I have no reason to say otherwise. He turned her life around by catching her, as she puts it. And there's a, there's a very funny flashback of him as a police officer saying, I accuse you. And there's a chase scene through this town. It's, it's apparently an Edo-era replica town that they use for filming, as they do here. And he catches her at last. Yes, because she runs around the corner, and there he is. There he is. And this is the beginning of a very odd turn to the Poirot character where he's a comic figure. This is a different Poirot from what you're used to. And yet he's still the smartest, most perceptive person in the room. He's more amusing. It's almost as though him being a little bit comic, kind of like the OCD in David Suchet's Poirot, it sets him apart from everyone else. 
he's a kind of a figure of fun, but at the same time, he's respected for his genius. Many of the other characters, they recognize him. They come up to him, including Ginny, right out of the novel, where she tells Poirot, I'm a kidnapped princess. She uses the correct Japanese terms. Child of the family. Yes, the, the child of, of a special magical family, and she's been kidnapped by uh, Mrs. Boynton. Poirot looks at her and thinks, you poor thing. And later on, when they are interviewing the family and all of the suspects after Mrs. Boynton is found dead, he actually tells Colonel Carberry, there's no point in interviewing Ginny because nothing she says is going to make any sense. He already knows. But there's also some acting choices here where you have to look at it and say, is this natural in Japanese drama? Are they playing it for laughs or not? And we have no idea. And we have no idea because the Colonel Carberry character, when he sees Poirot and he rushes towards him and says, oh my God, oh my God, you've got to take over this case. You've got to take over this case, which is very unlike what police do in the West. And any time that he's astounded by what Poirot does, he slaps himself in the middle of the forehead. And you think, my God, he's going to knock himself out at this rate. Another piece making this very Japanese is the Tengu. Mm -hmm. And Tengu are apparently spirits. There's a wide variety of them. Sometimes you will see them. There are also apparently in the hills around these shrines, there are wandering hermits who dress a particular way and their status is indicated by the color of the pom-pom. And this is, again, a beautiful reworking, culturally appropriate for the setting. This is a beautiful reworking of in the novel when Lady Westholm is sneaking around. And yes, we are spoiler heavy and it is Lady Westholm who does it. In the novel, she disguises herself as an Arab because at a dig, you've got Arab diggers and you see somebody go by in uh, the robes and their face is covered and you aren't going to pay any attention to them. And here, she disguises herself as a Tengu, complete with the mask and the floaty white robes. And so anybody who sees her, they're not going to think Lady Westholm, that's for sure. Everybody is already psyched to think that there are spirits because the spirit world is just on the other side. You just have to look a little more carefully. And there it is. That's where uh, Gin Ginny? Ginny. They call her Ginny, but her, her full name is Ginevra. Yeah, Ginny asks Poirot not to save her necessarily from the Tengu, but just make sure he stays away. You know, she sees him as a benign figure as long as she doesn't get entangled with a Tengu. Yeah, she doesn't have a problem with them. She mm -hmm. doesn't have a problem with them. And there's also the lovely bit where Poirot works out just how susceptible Amabel Pierce is. She's the biographer for Lady Westholm. Just how susceptible she is to suggestion and how gullible she is that she will inherit whatever the last thing is that someone said to her. There are little symbols around the hotel of a form of Tengu, which is a three-legged crow. And he tells her, oh my God, did you see that crow? It had three legs. And she's like, oh, 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 yes, I did. Yes, I did. Because she has to agree with him. But what that proves to Poirot, because if you watch carefully, despite this Poirot looking like a figure of fun, he is really paying attention to the people around him, and he watches her with Lady Westholm. He watches how Lady Westholm prompts Amabel to say certain things, to think certain ways, and he confirms it for himself that you can't believe anything Amabel Pierce says because she is never going to speak the truth unless it is by accident, but it isn't because she's a liar. It is because she... Wants Don't, to get along. She wants to get along so badly that she will agree with whatever anybody says to her. And that's kind of taking a Japanese characteristic, a cultural characteristic, to an extreme. Because the Japanese want to get along. They want to be free of conflict. So you have to be careful when talking with a Japanese person. Because we're Americans, we want answers to everything. We want a decision. We want this. Whereas they're more likely to be follow suggestion or be very subtle in the way in which they express a preference. Oh, yeah. We're, there's nothing subtle about Americans, and there's everything subtle, <laughs> subtle about the Japanese. But that's also why you get that Japanese proverb that the nail that sticks up the highest is the one that gets hammered down. The stalk of wheat that um, the you know, sticks up gets cut first. Gets cut first whereas, in, whereas an English similar one that has ends with ends up with a completely different meaning is the squeaky wheel gets the grease but that's not that's the not same. the japanese way that's not the <laughs> japanese way so when you watch this not only is this a beautiful wonderful true to the text adaptation of appointment with death they did it within the japanese context and it works 
it works tremendously. I mean, Lady Westholm, even more in this version than in the two English versions, she can't have her past revealed. She would be destroyed socially. She would be humiliated, absolutely humiliated. And it is very understandable why she commits suicide by flinging herself off the cliff rather than have her past revealed. When you see the other two versions, the Peter Ustinoff version handles Lady Westholm much better. It's Lauren Bacall. She has the past of having been a criminal and then, you know, and seen by Mrs. Boynton as the prison warden. And then she comes over, she remakes herself in England and marries well and becomes a member of parliament right out of the storyline. And again, she can't afford to have herself unmasked. When you see the David Suchet one, it was just stupid because Dame Westholm was an Irish maid who got knocked up by a house guest and uh, Mrs. Boynton stole her baby and sent her off to an Irish convent. She becomes a famous travel writer. And what does she care if she's revealed? It doesn't matter. And in fact, I think they dropped the entire subtext of Mrs. Boynton. I never forget anything, a name, a face, an action. And I didn't forget you either. So for this Lady Westholm in this version, it matters enormously because she either has to leave at once every single thing she has ever been familiar with, knowing that Mrs. Boynton will never let her go or she has to kill Mrs. Boynton and there will be no forgiveness for her either way. She will never be forgiven for having basically been a sneak thief and then remade her life and lied about her past. It just won't happen. Despite all the humor in this, the it's surprisingly up, funny. It's surprisingly funny. And there's there's a scene during the summing up, which is a long scene with Poirot because he goes through every family member, accuses them. There's a flashback each time of that person because uh, Mrs. Boynton is found on the bench in, in front the of woods, the shrine. in front of a shrine in the woods. You have to imagine this wooded path that goes from shrine to shrine and she's sitting on the bench. And this is a very key clue because she lets them go on her own without leaving her, her behind. leaving her behind. And she's doing that for a very good reason. And Poirot recognizes that this is wildly out of uh, character. character for Mrs. Boynton. She would never let any of her victims off the leash. And yet here she sends all five of them away. Yeah, so Why they... is she being left to sit alone, a woman who is a massive control freak? Why is she sitting alone on the bench? And the answer has to be that she's meeting someone that she doesn't want anyone to see the meeting. As a result, she ends up getting injected with digitalis and she dies. And the family members all come across her at various times, which is all explained very succinctly. And oh, yes. Poirot has to work backwards in order to make sh make them all confess that, yes, she was dead when they saw her, but they all lied to, to protect, protect each, each other. other. They all did not want a family member to be arrested for murder. Even though they were all glad, elated, overjoyed to see her dead. Except for Ginny. Except for Ginny. Ginny actually still feels a little bit of emotion, but it's the first emotion that she shows in the entire show. And again, they did this perfectly. The only other emotion you see Ginny show is towards the beginning of the film when she is sent to her room because her mother has decided that she is, she, she's, she's overtired tired. and she is ripping a piece of, uh, looks it like looks she's fabric. ripping her garment apart or a, or a big table napkin. She is ripping something up because she is so angry. Uh, if you did this in modern terms, she would go upstairs and start cutting herself because she is so angry and she can't re let out a single piece of emotion and she is heading into schizophrenia but what's so funny about the Poirot scene is that as he's accusing each person we're giving a flashback of that person attacking mrs boynton and, and digging a hypodermic into her arm including and, the tengu into, including the tengu so after like the fourth or fifth repetition of it you can't help but laugh at it because oh, yes. it becomes comic oh yes and in fact mrs boynton was actually seen by two different people Ginny and jefferson cope beating off a tengu mm -hmm. and you're everyone is thinking what 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 although i think they didn't say that it was a tengu that it was a, a hermit because of the well it was they a cross it, it was, was kind of like a cross kind of a between same. they assumed it was a hermit and not a tengu yeah. 
but it was still very unworldly that you were seeing Mrs. Boynton whacking her cane into this white clad figure with red pom-poms and a bizarre red devil mask that she is beating him off with her cane, but the Tengu overpowers her and kills her. The point, though, is that Poirot is going through everyone's statement, confirming that they lied so that you get to the only person who could have done it. What this ends up doing is it becomes very serious at the end because they realize, the family members realize, they were all covering up for each other. And none of them did it. That is important because it shows that there is hope for the future. And one of the things that is so much better about this one than especially the David Suchet, which ended, oh my God, Ginny meets her birth parents and then three minutes later watches them die. Oh God. Oh, it was just oh. awful. But <laughs> these kids, the Boyntons and Nadine, have hope for the first time. And they know that they did not betray each other which is even more important. It was an outsider who murdered their vicious mother. None of them are guilty. And that reminds me how beautifully Nadine was handled. She is the one who married in. She married Lennox Boynton, and he is heading deeply into self-induced catatonia. In the Ustinoff version, Carrie Fisher played Nadine, and she's apparently carrying on this torrid affair with Jefferson Cope, except it goes nowhere, and then it starts up, and then it disappears, and it just, just doesn't make any sense at all, and she still wants to be with Lennox, and you can't understand why. In the David Suchet version, they eliminated Nadine completely. But here, Nadine was exactly right. She loves Lennox, but she's having to leave him in order for her own sanity. Jefferson Cope is a good friend. He's the estate manager for Mrs. Boynton. He's a good friend of Nadine. He wants Nadine, but he wants her to be happy more. The scene there, that was really, it really travels the emotional range because he's, you expect him to be angry, but he's actually forgiving of her. He, he recognizes. wants her to be happy more than he wants her for himself. And there was never a physical relationship between the two of them, unlike in the Ustinov version. And there never was a physical relationship between them. Nadine never cheated on her husband. Mm -hmm. She chose Jefferson Cope because jealousy was would if jealousy didn't make Lennox break out of the catatonia, nothing would. And it ends on a comic note again where Jefferson turns away from her to give his last, you know, benediction, turns around. I want you to be happy. Wants you to be happy and turns around and sees Poirot standing there. And not Nadine, and he bursts into tears. <laughs> and falls on Poirot's <laughs> arms crying. And it was just because it mattered it to him. Matter. He does love Nadine, but he loves her enough to want her happiness. And in the Japanese culture, to not reveal the emotion is very, very, very important, which makes him collapsing into Poirot's arms all the more affecting because the dam breaks. Oh, yes, because he's very calm throughout. Even when he is talking about seeing Mrs. Boynton beat off a Tengu, he is very calm throughout. It is devastating to him. And you never get that sense of devastation at all in the Ustinoff version. And you don't have, and because there's no Nadine in the Suchet version, well, again, you don't get that payoff. Well, the Suchet version was so completely rewritten, it might as well have not <laughs> been appointment with death. If you want to see the right version of Appointment with Death, there are reasons to watch the Ustinoff version, and Lauren Bacall is one of them. This is so much better. That emotion, how Nadine was handled, the entire family's issue was handled seriously. They didn't try to make Mrs. Boynton into anything other than what she was, one of the great Christie villains, a woman who really deserved to be murdered, this shows you what kind of a villain Mrs. Boynton is, because she saw the opportunity to get another victim in her fold, and it was the victim who pushed her out of her own hotel room, that would be Lady Westholm, proving what a pathetic waste of space she was, that she's a powerless old woman. When Lady Westholm murders her, Mrs. Boynton still gets her revenge, mm -hmm. because Lady Westholm is ruined. She ruins Lady Westholm without even revealing the secret. So she still wins from wherever she is, you know, in the fiery furnace. She can look up and say, I still succeeded. I killed someone who had completely remade her life to be a better 
person. Some people just want to watch the world burn, as someone famous said. (laughs) I have always thought that the people who think that have never built anything because it is so easy to tear down a house. It is so easy to smash windows. It is so easy to cut down a tree that took a hundred years to grow. And you know, you cannot rebuild in anywhere near as fast as you can destroy. Destruction is easy and mrs boyenton specialized in destruction Mm -hmm. and it's really a tragedy for lady westholm it is her tragedy that she ran into mrs boyenton because she had remade herself and her life is over but at the same time the boyenton children and nadine are are free. free they are free and you can see that they're going to have a happier life they did not betray each other they did not turn on each other They hung together as a group. One of them didn't kill mom. None of them killed mom. And they got all the money. And they got all the money. You know that Raymond is going to marry Dr. Sarah. Uh, You're not sure what will happen with Ginny or Carol or Jefferson Cope, but they can move forward with their lives now. (laughs) Whatever happens in the future, it will be better than what they had. So I'm looking forward to the next movie we can find. Oh, yes, absolutely. Because they did three. They did three. So there's uh, an Orient Express, which we haven't found, but there's also uh, Roger Ackroyd. Roger Ackroyd. Which we are going to watch. And there's also a Japanese version of And Then mm. There Were None, four hours worth. And I am really looking forward to seeing how it's handled by a Japanese studio because it is not going to be an American or an English production. It is going to be different. Yep. And that's one of the great things about watching the foreign adaptations. It's a different way of looking at an elemental story. Yeah. And also how well it applies to take an English writer like Agatha Christie and apply it to a different culture. And boy, it fits beautifully. It fit beautifully. You wouldn't think that an English writer for a story set on an archaeological dig would translate so perfectly to 1955 Japan and a Shinto shrine in the woods. And yet it fit perfectly. And it was funny. Mm-hmm. It was funny. Be pre- you know, as I said, Poirot is played almost as a comic character, but he's still the smartest person in the room. Mm-hmm. And he has an amusing relationship with Lady Westholm to the point where you get to watch her push him down the hillside to watch him roll down the hill. Mm-hmm. And that Pull time it's just mustache. for fun. That, that time it's just for fun because it's she thought it would be funny. And then the second time she does it because she has to cover up what she's about to do. That makes it a joke the first time and a serious plot point the second. And then it's it's echoed again a third time when she jumps off the cliff. Mm, oh, Ooh, that's And then good. it becomes a tragedy. Oh, you don't see man. her jump off the cliff. Again, that echoes the two previous falls. Yeah, but there's some like romantic elements in the scenes between them. And she sits down on the couch next to him and says, is there anybody you were ever in love with? And he says, yes, exactly. Not exactly in love with, but a woman you never forgot. And yes, there was. It was the woman who murdered five husbands, one after the other. Absolutely. And then she reaches over and pulls on his mustache as a result. (laughs) Just like, oh, you irritating man. Clearly, Japanese culture is different in certain areas with uh, male-female relationships. And that's something else that they really handled well. In the novel, Raymond and Dr. Sarah approach each other. They're attracted to each other, and she's trying to figure out what's going on, and she feels sorry for him. But at the same time, she's attracted to him, and he sees girl, pretty girl, the first girl who's ever paid attention to to him who's ever been able to pay attention to him of course he falls head over heels immediately probably the same reason lennox fell head over heels with nadine because she's the first girl who was able to pay attention to him and when you see the i guess it's sort of handled okay in the ustonoff version it's been a long time since i've seen it but i remember in the Suchet version raymond and dr sarah it was so stupid you wondered why they were even talking to each other when they had absolutely no interest in each other other than to say please get out of the way while i'm going through the door they have no interest but here you get this very tentative gentle attraction which is what they should be feeling so i think we can just go ahead and wrap this up right uh it was great It was great. Uh, Just a reminder, I do write reviews of the episodes, and they are all on our website, peschelpress.com. So if you want to read my reviews going back to uh, when we started the Agatha Project a couple years ago, they're all there. 
Eventually, all of our reviews are going to be turned into a book called Agatha Christie, She Watched. And we have uh, some annotated Agatha Christie novels as well, the first six novels. So if you want to learn more about the history behind the mystery, visit our website. If you want to meet us in person, look at our events on PeschelPress.com. And we do events, and we're always happy to talk about Agatha Christie, the novels, the film adaptations, or the background behind the novel she wrote. And that concludes another episode of Agatha Christie She Watched. I'm Bill Peschel. And I'm Teresa Peschel. And we'll see you at the movies. Agatha Christie, She Watched, is Teresa Peschel and Bill Peschel, produced by Bill Peschel. Theme song, Call to Adventure, by Kevin McLeod. New episodes come out every week wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm backslash mystery and leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on Mystery She Watched, email peschel at peschelpress.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to peschel at peschelpress.com. And thank you for listening.